Well, greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to the John Campia Podcast, episode number 30 for Wednesday, July the 13th, 2016. My name is John Campia. I'm, of course, your host around these parts. And thank you so much uh, for joining me on this kind of relaunch of my YouTube channel. You know, I started putting the podcast also up in video form. And so far, the response from you guys has been great. And uh, the guys, those of you who are just listening to the podcast, you don't seem to mind. You, you said you don't really notice any differences. So that's great news. So I guess we're just going to keep on rolling with this. Um, hey, I'm going to try something a little bit different on my YouTube channel. You might want to keep your eye open for this. We watched um, Deadpool the other night because one of our friends hadn't seen Deadpool yet. And actually, it's going to be a feature on our Comic-Con HQ show because it's our friend Haleta. Haleta, who works with me on my show comic on my f- show uh, Film HQ over on the Comic-Con HQ network. And we were having lunch a few weeks ago, a group of us, and it came out that Haleta didn't get a chance to see Deadpool and just never did have the chance. So we watched it with her and we filmed her reactions watching Deadpool. And that's going to be on Film HQ this weekend. But it got me to thinking, man, I, I noticed some things. I saw Deadpool a number of times in theaters when it was out. But I noticed some things this time around that I didn't notice the first few times around. And so I'm going to start putting up a couple things called revisit reviews, where I'm going to go back and review a movie that was out a few months ago. And I'm going to revisit again now that I've watched it again a few months later and see what kind of different things I notice whenever. So I'm going to be putting up a revisiting Deadpool uh, review in a couple of days. So keep your eyes open for that on my YouTube channel and make sure you subscribe to Comic-Con HQ. Uh, it's at www.comic-conhq.com. It's a free trial right now until after Comic-Con is done and our show Film HQ is on there. But Mark Hamill has a show on there, Nathan Fillion, Alan Tudyk, uh, yeah, Kevin Pereira, Adam Sessler. Like we've all got shows on there. So make sure you come on over to Comic-Con HQ and join us. So with that out of the way, Got a bunch of things we need to talk about today. We're going to talk about this Warner Brothers stuff. We're going to talk about Pokemon, looking like it's getting a movie, Dwayne Johnson, Fast Five, a whole bunch of questions. So let's get into it. And I guess we got to start with this revelation that came out the other day. Although I got to tell you, to me, it wasn't a revelation. It got discovered that Warner Brothers games, not Warner Brothers pictures, not the movie division, okay? Warner Brothers games was uh, just busted by the, uh, uh, what's the federal business thing? The FDC? Anyway, for, I'm, you know, I know it's the wrong thing. And for arguments, I'll call it the FDC, whatever. The government busted them for um, paying popular YouTube video game people to give their games. One in particular was one of the, their Lord of the Rings game. To give their Lord of the Rings game a positive review. Now, the federal commission basically said... Um, look, what you can't, you consumers, said the Federal Commission, have a right to know if the people they are trusting for their reviews of games are being paid for those reviews. People have the right to know. And so Warner Brothers Games got a big fine. No word yet on if the individual gamers are, are they, like, what the big, most prominent one was PewDiePie. PewDiePie was the big one who got busted for this, that he accepted payment to do a positive review. Now, it's not that Warner Brothers Games came to PewDiePie and said, here's $20,000, go make a positive review of this game. It was more pretty worded than that. It's like, here, we'll give you this money and you do a feature on, on our game, but don't mention any problems you have with the game. Don't mention any bugs you found in the game. Don't speak, say anything negative about the game and don't say anything negative about Warner Brothers. And then we suggest, Warner Brothers said, thinking this was getting around the rules, we suggest that in your YouTube description, in your read more or find out more, somewhere we suggest that you put in there that, hey, this is a sponsored piece of content. Well, the Federal Commission said that's not good enough. You have to let people know right up front if your review has been bought. You have to let people know that. Now, This is not totally new. A couple of years ago, one of the better movie websites out there, Slash Film, I'm sure many of you are familiar with Slash Film, great site run by Peter Serretta, who's a a friend of mine and has been in this business a long time, super cool. He got into doing some sponsored posts where like a studio would come to him and say, hey, write an article about this movie we have coming up. And like it'd be a movie that Peter hasn't seen. So it says, don't say that you like the movie because you haven't seen the movie, but do us a favor, write a big article on this upcoming movie and we would pay you for it. 
And I remember Peter and Slash Home went, okay, we can do that. But right in their title, they would put, let's say, the, I'm just making something up, okay? I'm just pulling this out of thin air. This wasn't a real situation. Let's just say for, for argument's sake, they were doing, and this was years ago, but let's say it was happening today and Slash Home was doing a sponsored piece for uh, Secret Life of Pets, okay? So what Slash Home would do, which I thought was perfectly acceptable, they would put up... Um, Understanding the tech, a, a headline say, the technology behind Secret Life of Pets sponsored content. And they put it in big letters. Look, we're going to write a, an article on the technology they use to make Secret Life of Pets. But just so you know right up front, this is sponsored content. They are paying us to write this piece about the technology behind. And like they never paid Slash Home for a review. They said feature content and Slash Home would say, hey, sponsored content. They would let their readers know right up front uh, even though there was nothing wrong with the articles they were writing anyway, <clears throat> they were just factual articles, Slash them will let them know, sponsored content. Now, they got a lot of blowback from their fans, um, who I don't think really understood what Slash was doing, but they got a lot of blowback and a lot of negative feedback from their fans. So Peter went, hey, our fans don't like this, so we're not going to do it anymore. Even though I think Peter was acting completely above board and, and completely legitimately because he let his fans know up front, Hey, just so you know, this piece of content, this one specific piece of content is sponsored, just so you know. And so they were very forthright with their audience, and I thought that was fine. So, but that's a different situation than here. This is a situation where Warner Brothers Games uh, paid video game players, uh, YouTube personalities, specifically PewDiePie and a few others, to give a rundown, tell people to go and sign up for the game, uh, and, and all this kind of stuff, and they were forbidden from saying anything negative about it. And they were not required to d reveal to their audience, to divulge to their audience that this was paid for content. And the federal commission said, that's a no-no. You cannot do that. That is wrong. And so Warner Brothers Games got hammered with a huge fine. They're banned and forbidden from ever doing anything like this again. And I'm sure other video game studios, are, I'm sure, are taking note. Now, um, the reason this is so relevant right now is because, look, when the whole backlash happened against Batman v Superman, and, you know, I was one of the few guys that liked Batman v Superman, but there was this huge, ridiculous backlash where people saying, Marvel, I don't know why they thought it was Marvel. Marvel is paying critics to say bad things about Batman v Superman. And now with Ghostbusters, you have a bunch of these uh, inbred uh, morons out there who are saying, anybody who's saying anything positive about new Ghostbusters, even though they haven't seen it, anybody who's saying anything positive about the new Ghostbusters, which is the vast majority of critics, they're being paid. But the thing is, what this Warner Brothers games thing shows us is you can't do that if you're a studio. If you try to do that, and, and Warner Brothers Games thought they found a way around it by suggesting to the YouTubers, hey, somewhere in their YouTube uh, descriptions, just throw in the bottom there, oh, this, this is sponsored content. No, 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 not good enough. Some of you remember that about 13 years ago, Sony Pictures, not video games, Sony Pictures got busted because they were putting up like, you know how when you see a commercial for a movie or or a, a trailer for a movie or a poster for a movie, they'll have a quick little quote from a film critic and say, like, best movie of the summer or so-and-so from JoeBlow.com or whatever, right? Sony got busted like 13 years ago. Some of you might remember this. For putting up a fake quote from a fictional film critic. Basically, they made up a film critic that didn't really exist. And they were putting up, like, quotes from his review that didn't really exist, um, saying, you know, this Sony movie, best movie of the summer by Joe Hackenfrack, whatever. It's a guy who didn't exist. It wasn't a real person. Sony got busted. The hammer got brought down on them. The company was completely humiliated and embarrassed, rightfully so. But what that did was that sent a shockwave through. That's, look, it was a warning message. The government was making an example out of Sony, rightfully so. So it was a message to other studios, you cannot pull this kind of crap because if you do, the hammer will be brought down on you and you will, your company will go through public humiliation. And Sony was, you know, Sony's lucky Twitter and Facebook weren't really prevalent in uh, back then because 
like that would have just destroyed them <laughs> back then. But, but the, still, they were very publicly embarrassed and humiliated because of it. And that is brings up like one of the big things today is that these are it's these things that should let people who aren't, you know, mentally frozen in a glacier somewhere, it should let people understand that studios do not pay critics, movie critics for reviews because they can't. They can't. It's too big of a risk. Look, let's say um, some of these people were coming at me saying my Ghostbusters review was was paid for, which it was not. But let's say th that Sony did approach me, me, with like 50,000 subscribers on YouTube. PewDiePie has like millions, he's like tens of millions of subscribers. I had 50,000. That's tiny compared to most major sites, okay? And I'm not a major YouTube site. I'm a, I'm a small YouTube channel. This is my personal YouTube channel. This is my hobby, all right? Let's say Sony decided to come to me and offer me $5,000, I don't know, or $1,000. So here's the risk they're taking. They come to me, for first of all, for a site that has 50,000 subscribers, what's the value for them? But anyway, let's say they did. They come to me, what happens if I say no? Not only am I saying no, if they come to a quote-unquote journalist and offer me money to give a positive review to their movie, what happens when I say no? I'm going to tell everybody. I'm going to bloody tell everybody everybody Sony tried to pay me off. I'm going to tell everybody. And Sony knows that. It tried to, it, they, and there's like 200 critics, right? They're giving positive reviews. I know, I think right now it's about 100 critics. I don't know. But it's like 100 critics out there getting positive reviews. You think they were all paid by Sony? You think Sony's going to go, hey, let's go out and tell hundreds of people we want to pay you off because if even one of them blows the whistle and Sony can't control it, all it takes is one of them to blow the whistle. And let's say Sony came to me and offered me money and I said, sure. Well now, okay, so I take 500 bucks or I take $5,000, whatever. What happens now in three months if Sony pisses me off? Hmm? What happens if in three months I tell Sony, hey, Sony, um, you should fly me out and um, let me visit the new set of the new uh, James Bond and put me up in a four-star hotel and give me $100,000 because uh, if you don't, I'm going to tell everybody a few months ago, you paid me $5,000. I mean, I don't care. This this movie review, this is my hobby on my YouTube channel. I don't care if I if I bust myself for taking money. Uh, you give me $100,000 or I'm spilling the beans. What's to stop me from doing that? But now it's not just me. It would be 100 film critics. If they gave $1 to any film critic, not only are they risking the film critic saying no right now, and then busting them and spreading the word about it. And then the federal commission comes down on Sony. They get humiliated. They get ruined. And they can't have that, especially after the leaked emails of a couple of years ago. But not only are they at risk of somebody saying no now, now they've got 100 potential blackmail situations moving forward. That, oh crap, we gave Campia that $500 once. And now he's telling us, he wants to be listed as an associate producer on the new James Bond movie, or else he's going to tell all the other media that we bribed him for a good review of Ghostbusters. They're, they're dead. They're busted. There, there is simply no logic here. There is no logic. And I think this Warner Brothers game scenario points out exactly. See, there are some people saying this Warner Brothers game scenario shows that studios could be paying off movie critics, even though it's a totally different industry, could be paying off movie critics. I contend that it's completely the opposite. This Warner Brothers game situation shows you exactly why studios ain't going to try to bribe movie critics. They ain't going to do it because they will get busted. And when they get busted, it will cost them. Like, <clears throat> what benefit is there to Sony for giving me $1,000? A, a, a moderately, and my my positive review was a lukewarm positive review. <laughs> Getting one lukewarm positive review on a dude who has fifty thousand subscribers on his YouTube channel. What's that? So that's what's what upside is there? But the downside is he could blow the whistle on us. We could get busted. Somebody could find out that we did this, and we get ruined. It ain't worth it. It ain't worth it. There is simply, you have to be one of the dumbest individuals in the world. And there are a bunch of them out there. But you seriously have to be a monumentally world-class moron to believe that in this environment, 
when Sony got busted 13 years ago, not for bribing uh, any critics, but just for making up fake quotes, they got busted for that hammer. Warner Brothers Games is now, and they weren't, I mean, it's a very unique situation. Look, because I understood with, um, with PewDiePie, like I got told a number of years ago by a studio person that the studio was putting up like $50,000 for PewDiePie. Okay. They, it was for a movie. It was for that movie that I can't remember the name of the movie. It was the movie that was out last year about the catacombs under Paris. It was that horror movie. I think, um, as above, so below or, or whatever. I can't remember the name of the movie. Drop it in the comment section if you remember, but the studio paid PewDiePie like a fee of $50,000 and flew him out to Paris to make a video of him going through, to pr help promote the movie, to make a video of him going down through the catacombs. And pr personally, I have no problem with that as long as he isn't saying, hey guys, I saw, and he's not a film critic, but as long as PewDiePie didn't go, hey guys, I saw this as above, so below movie, and it's awesome, now follow me through the catacombs of Paris. As long as he didn't do that, I actually got no problem with it. You want to pay PewDiePie 50 grand to just go and to, as a promotional piece for the film, show him just going through the catacombs, as long as you don't have him saying that he saw the movie and he loved the movie, I actually have no problem with that. I <clears throat> I think that's totally above board, no problem with that whatsoever. But um, but as, as this applies to movies, I think this, this is a good thing that Warner Brothers busted, got busted for this, that Warner Brothers games got busted. And it's important to know, this is totally different like companies. Warner Brothers games and Warner Brothers pictures are two run by completely different people. But uh, I'm glad that this happened. This should send a, a shockwave and, and let people know that this stuff doesn't happen in the film critic community because it's not worth it. It's simply not worth it. So anyway, that's that. I'm going to fly through the next thing because I spent like 15 minutes on that topic, but it's the one that everybody was asking me to talk about. Um, <clears throat> this interesting second thing came up where... Um, David Ayer, um, who is the director of the new Suicide Squad, I cannot wait to see the Suicide Squad movie. He got asked recently about the role Batman is going to be playing in this movie. And it got me really excited because I'm, I'm going to paraphrase here. But David Ayer went on to talk about how Batman, remember every movie we've seen Batman in is basically told from Batman's point of view and his perspective. We see Bruce Wayne, the man. We see him in the Batcave figuring out situations. We see him putting his equipment together, blah, blah, blah. He goes, we've never looked at Batman from the perspective of the villain. Like looking at a story in which Batman is in it, but this story is told from the villain's perspective. He is a demon in the night. He's, he's the ghost. He's the boogeyman, <clears throat> which, pardon me, <clears throat> which is exactly what Bruce Wayne wants to be. That's why he wears that costume. That's why he took on the symbol of his greatest fear, the bat. And so David Ayer is talking about how Batman in this movie, none of this is being told from Batman's perspective. We're not going to see Batman planning out how he's going to intercept the Joker or Harley Quinn or the Suicide Squad. No, 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 no. This is being told from the Suicide Squad, the villain's point of view. And from their point of view, Batman is Jason Voorhees. From their point of view, Batman is Mike Myers. Michael Myers, I should say. Mike Myers is yeah, a very different guy. Um, he's the demon in the night. He is the boogeyman who comes to get you. And they're going to portray Batman from their point of view, in that way. And I got so excited hearing that. I mean, I think that is the right approach to do this for Batman. I think it's what the people want to see. And I think it's going to come across on screen beautifully if they execute it right. And for those of you who are big critics of DC movies because you didn't like what Zack Snyder has done, th that's cool. This ain't Zack Snyder. This is David Ayer. And you're going to be hard pressed to find anybody who knows much about movies who won't tell you that Dave Ayer isn't a pretty solid, damn solid director. Some will even tell you he's a great director. I would tell you he's a great director. So I think this in his hands is going to be freaking exciting. All right. Uh, next thing that kind of came up that caught my interest was we all know that they've started shooting Fast 8 and it's going to be really interesting now to see where this franchise goes without Paul Walker and stuff like that. But you knew, look, this franchise turned itself around because I thought one was just a blatant beat by beat, story point by story point rip off of Point Break. I didn't like two. And I thought three was terrible. I thought Tokyo Drift was terrible. I know Tokyo Drift has some fans out there. That's awesome. For me, I thought three was terrible. And then all of a sudden, 
4 comes along. And 4 was not bad. 4 was was not bad. And then came 5. And 5 kind of just blew the doors off, and then six, and of course seven. And and one of the big reasons for the big momentum shift turnaround and the big box office rise of this was the inclusion of Dwayne The Rock Johnson. It was a good fit for him. And his uh, character Dobbs is a great character that fits. He's a great fitting character in this world that they created. So you knew that with Paul Walker uh, having passed away, and it's really unfortunate and sad, but you knew there was a little bit of a gap there that needed to be filled in, and you probably knew they were going to fill in most of that gap with more Dwayne Johnson. Well, one of the first pictures from the set of Fast 8 came out, and it's Dwayne Johnson, as you can see the picture here. Dwayne Johnson in handcuffs, in prison, in that orange jumpsuit. He's in prison. So this does raise a couple of interesting questions. Question number one, is he undercover? Could Dwayne Johnson be going undercover to try to get information from somebody who's in prison? We've seen that um, plot device used before in other movies, sometimes well, sometimes not so well, but that's a possibility. Possibility number two, or question number two, is he was he sent to prison for helping Vin Diesel? Did, did some oversight board look at him and his actions saying, look, you overstepped your bounds, And so you're going to be punished, you're stripped of your job, and you're going to jail. And maybe part of Fast 8 is going to be about breaking Dobbs out of jail. That's interesting. That's kind of fascinating. I'm just curious, what do you think? Like, you see this picture of Dwayne Johnson. I think our big two possibilities here are, one, he's going undercover in jail, or two, he's been busted by the authorities saying, you overstepped your bounds as a law enforcement officer, you actually broke the law, you're going to jail. Which one of those two scenarios do you think it is? Or do you think it's a third scenario? That's totally possible too. Jump in the comments and let me know what you think about that. Uh, The fourth thing I wanted to bring up here is very excited. Look, one of the most big pleasant surprise movies of last year uh, was Kingsman. That movie was just this little kind of indie feel kind of movie with uh, Taron Egerton, a guy that really most people had never, ever heard of. Colin Firth was in it, and that was interesting, but, you know, Colin Firth ain't an action guy. Um, and, of course, you know, Michael Caine's in there. Samuel Jackson was a pretty good villain. Um, and the movie just shocked everybody. It, it's so fun. Such a fun movie, and the audiences just kept going back. It's because it didn't premiere big, but word of mouth got out there, and it just steamrolled at the box office, and people more and more went back to it. But... If you haven't seen the original Kingsman, I'm going to warn you right now, I'm about to give a spoiler from the original Kingsman, okay? It's a big spoiler. Most of you probably heard this by now, but I'm just giving you fair warning, okay? All right. So Colin Firth, who, who know, who knew this dude could play a badass action hero, okay? His character, I believe the character's name was Harry. So damn good. Such a great character. And he dies in the first one, right? Pretty definitively, he gets shot in the face. So what happens is when they start talking about Kingsman 2, like we're all like really unfortunate they can't get Colin Firth back. But then they start hinting, well, maybe Colin Firth could come back. Ah, they're not bringing Colin Firth back. And then they put this picture out a little while ago of Harry's glasses on a table with the words written under the table, uh, reports of my death have been greatly exaggerated. It's like, oh, come on. That's, come on. They're just teasing people. They're not bringing back. Well, then they release this picture One of the cast members of the new Kingsman that they're filming right now, of Kingsman 2, one of the cast members puts up an Instagram picture of him with Colin Firth with the little caption, hide behind Harry, because he's kind of hiding behind Colin Firth, right? And he's there with the glasses. Colin Firth is on set. He's shooting. So I don't know if this means that that we're going to have flashbacks of Harry or if they've actually found a way to bring Colin Firth's character back. I hope they found a way to bring him back, man, just because I love him so much. It would make no sense. Dude got shot in the face. I get that, and I don't care. I love that character. I want more screen time with this character, so I hope they find a way to pull that off. Um, Next thing here, Javier Bardem. And look, this is something big enough for me to really talk about on my podcast in one sense, but Javier Bardem, it's being reported that he's in talks now to play Frankenstein. Well, more specifically, Frankenstein's monster. Uh, A lot of people call the monster Frankenstein. Remember, the monster's name is not Frankenstein. Frankenstein is the name of the scientist who created the monster. The monster's name is actually uh, Frankenstein's monster, but whatever. That's neither here nor there. Javier Bardem is in talks to play Frankenstein's monster in the new universal monsters, classic monsters universe. 
And you know, this is just another, if this works out and if he actually signs, this is just another feather in their cap because I don't think, I know I didn't. I don't think a lot of us took this new universal rebooted monster universe really seriously at first. I don't think a lot of us took it very seriously. But then all of a sudden they cast Tom Cruise. It's like, whoa, Tom Cruise, I believe he's in The Mummy. And then they cast Johnny Depp. It's like, whoa. And now they're casting Academy Award winner Javier Bardem in the Frankenstein one. Now, they haven't announced a Frankenstein movie, so one has to assume that Frankenstein's monster is probably going to make an appearance in one of the already scheduled upcoming Monster Universe movies. But look, full kudos to Universal, man. They are, they are going all in. They are not, with no reservation, they are going all in, foot to the floor on this monster's universe thing they're setting up, this monster's classic monster shared universe thing. They are fully committed to it, and they are going all out to secure the biggest names and the biggest talent to be in there. So if there was any of you out there, like me, who wasn't taking this seriously, who thought this is just a little side thing that Universal is doing it, it ain't. They are going full-blown balls to the walls on this, and good for them. And uh, anyway, the last question we're going to get to before we get to the uh, questions you guys have emailed into me. Um, I've got four questions that people have emailed uh, into me. This is inevitable. So a while ago, a report came out. This is some time ago. A report came out that there were some discussions about certain studios maybe wanting to pick up the rights to Pokemon and uh, maybe look at another Pokemon movie. And I said, well, you know, the last number of movies they did bombed. There's not really that passionate interest for like, I mean, amongst its fans, it's passionate, but there's not a wide passionate interest in Pokemon. So I don't really think anything's going to come of that. Well, sometimes you make an assumption on something and then a new piece of information comes out. In this case, a new piece of information is that new damn mobile game came out, that Pokemon Go. I have not played it. I refuse to play it. My wife, how I lost my wife to Pokemon Go. I am a Pokemon Go widower. Um, I haven't seen or talked to my wife basically in four days. Oh, she's here in our place with us, but she's not here. She's in the Pokemon world and then outside walking around trying to catch more things. So yes, right now I am a Pokemon widower. Uh, I lost my wife to Pokemon about four or five days ago. Uh, so the new piece of information is this game has become a worldwide phenomenon. Like everywhere I walk around in Burbank now, you see people looking down at their phones and you re oh, oh yeah, that person's playing Pokemon and that every freaking buddy's playing this Pokemon Go game. Now, I'm not here to criticize the Pokemon Go game, not at all. It looks like people are having a lot of fun with it. But that changes things, doesn't it? So when a new thing comes into the battlefield, no pun intended, as in this new a new worldwide phenomena sweeping the globe game, Pokemon Go comes out, well, that changes our perspective now, doesn't it, on the potential for another Pokemon movie. That changes it completely. So Legendary Pictures apparently is, is secure the rights, and they're saying they're de going to develop a Pokemon movie. Strike while the iron's hot, Legendary. Get moving on this fast, because this is mobile gaming. This fad could be gone in five days. It could last, it could be like World of Warcraft and last for 10 years, who knows. But Legendary, uh, probably pretty smart. They are launching into developing a Pokemon movie. And I mean, who can blame them at this point? So look, just because something is a good mobile game doesn't mean there's a story to it. And doesn't mean you, there's something there. But look, what story is there behind Lego? Lego are just colored plastic building bo blocks. Like what story is there in Lego? There is none. And yet somehow they found a way to make a pretty damn awesome movie out of Lego. So let's sit back, relax, and see what comes out of that. All right. So I am going to take some uh, questions from you guys. Once again, you can send in a question to me. The way you can get me to answer a question on my podcast is send your question to the John Campia podcast at gmail.com. That's the John Campia podcast at gmail.com. Send it on in. Maybe you'll see your question get answered on my show. Uh, and by the way, I'm thinking about a new schedule for my podcast. You guys tell me if this works for you. I'm thinking three days a week, Saturday, Monday, and Wednesday for new episodes of the podcast. So let me know what you think about that. Uh, I'm, I'm just far too busy to do more, to do like five days a week. I can't do that. But I'm thinking three days a week is a uh, is a good number. So anyway, let's get to the first question. This first question comes from, who's it come from? It comes from Ryan Brenneman, who writes, 
In the months since episode 7 hit Blu-ray, I've seen more and more people, some of whom get a lot of likes with their comments, who are coming out and calling The Force Awakens a poor film because it ripped off A New Hope. Have you seen these sort of comments and what do you think about the accusation? Um, well, look, I, I, there's no denying that episode 7 follows the same, I, I guess you could call it the same story blueprint as the original Star Wars. There's no denying that. It certainly does. But you got to remember, going into Star Wars Episode 7, one of the biggest complaints people had about Star Wars was that Star Wars wasn't Star Wars anymore. Especially coming out of the prequels. They just didn't feel like Star Wars. They felt like some sci-fi stuff, but it didn't feel like Star Wars. And that was one of the biggest complaints out there. And I think one of the missions that J.J. Abrams had and that Lucasfilm and Kathleen Kennedy had was, we've got to get the feel of Star Wars back. And so for that, they decided we need to go all out with that to make sure people make feel like, even though it's 30 years later, this is Star Wars, that The Force Awakens is Star Wars. So they went back and they took kind of the, the rough structure blueprint of A New Hope and they kind of applied that blueprint to this new film. You can't rip off something that is your own already. Like A New Hope is not a ripoff of, of or sorry, uh, The Phantom Menace. Let me try that again. The Force Awakens... I clearly have not had uh, any coffee today. Uh, not that I drink coffee. Has is not a ripoff of a new hope because I mean that they it's that's theirs. You can't rip off something that's yours. It's also not as similar as some people. There are a couple of major plot beats that are similar. Absolutely they are. But here's the thing. These are just excuses that people are making. Um I find what we do as human beings, myself included, you you probably too. When you don't like a movie, you will grasp at things not that you have to, but that this is what we do. You grasp at things to, to throw at the thing you don't like. Look, somebody didn't like The Phantom Menace. Let me try that again. Somebody didn't like The Force Awakens. Somebody didn't like The Force Awakens. And so one of the ways to express their dislike of it is the easy one saying, oh, it's just a ripoff of four. Well, it's not really a ripoff of four, but that doesn't change the fact that you didn't like it. And that's cool right? because the movies are subjective. You know, you know that I am not afraid to say I hated a Star Wars movie. Um, but I like this one. You know, it's, uh, what, seven months later. I, I still love this movie. I still really, really enjoy it. I, I don't think it's the best Star Wars movie ever made. I think it's the fourth best Star Wars movie ever made. I still think Return of the Jedi is my favorite. Uh, A New Hope is my second favorite. Empire is my third favorite. And The Force Awakens is my fourth. And that's like 10, 9.9, 9.8, 8.5. So that's kind of the way I, I do it. But... You know, and these this is new. These were criticisms that some people were levying at the movie when the movie first came out. It's not new now. These are things that came out earlier. So, and you know, like I said, on the surface, it's a fair criticism. I think it goes too far. But to say you saw a lot of similarities between The Force Awakens and A New Hope, I think that's a fair criticism because there are, especially in certain plot beats, there are similarities. But I don't think that stopped it from being a really good movie. Not at all. So anyway, that's just my thought. We'll move on to the next question. And the next question comes from uh, JC Rojas, who writes, do you think Marvel villains will be much better developed in phase three? I personally really enjoyed Zemo in Civil War. Yeah, I, I mean, like, you know my thoughts on this. I love Civil War. I thought Zemo was terrible. I thought it was a waste of a character. I thought ultimately he was pretty damn pointless. But John, he's the one who orchestrates. Ah, 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 ah. If if I if you want to sit down and get into it for a half hour, those things were already in motion. I can go into that until I'm blue in the face. I didn't not like Zemo, but that's just me. A lot of people like yourself, JC. You loved Zemo. That's great. Nothing wrong with that. But do I think, but look, as much as I like the Marvel movies, one of the fair criticisms about Marvel that other than maybe Loki and, and the Red Skull, I like the Red Skull, their villains have not been highlights of their movies. In some of their movies, even some of their really good movies, their villains have been kind of weak. But the thing is, I think that's because of the philosophy Marvel has. Marvel's philosophy is our movies are not about our villains. Our movies are about our heroes and our fans love our heroes. And thus, the vast majority of screen time and everything will always be on our heroes. Our villains are there as plot devices to motivate the heroes into their action. But the, but the villains are not the stars of our movies. That's, I'm not saying that's the right philosophy. I'm not saying that's the wrong philosophy. I'm just saying that is Marvel's philosophy when it comes to their movies. 
that the villains are not the most important things. Our heroes are the most important things. The villains are simply there to be the motivating driving factor to move our heroes into action. And so they don't spend much time on their villains other than Loki. Um, and look, it's hard to argue with their results. This has worked for them. It wouldn't necessarily work for DC. It wouldn't necessarily work for Universal in some of their movies. It wouldn't necessarily work for this or that. But for Marvel, it's hard to argue that it hasn't worked for them. For them, it has worked. And so it's kind of hard to argue that they should be doing it any different. So do I think we're going to see much more time and development on their villains moving into phase three? I doubt it. I don't even think we're going to spend a lot of time on Thanos. Like we've been introduced to Thanos in little teaspoons, but we know pretty much all Marvel needs us to know about him. He's big, he's bad, he's the most powerful being in the galaxy, and he's got his eyes on Earth. That's all we need to know. From Marvel's point of view, that's all we need to know. And so because of that, I don't think they're going to spend a lot of time developing their villains moving forward. And after seeing Civil War, and they don't need to spend a lot of time developing their villains. It's always going to be one of their weaker spots. But as long as they keep getting the results and entertaining the audiences and people love the movies, no reason for them to change it. Now, I, they, like I said, they have Loki. I'm sure somewhere along the line, they'll bring in another villain that we get more introduced to. I just don't think it's going to be the, the habit. I think we will get a new villain that gets more developed here and there, but it won't become the norm for Marvel. That's just my thoughts on this. So let me know what you guys think. Uh, two more questions. This one comes from uh, Yuhan, who writes, Hey, just wanted to ask, what is it that appeals uh, about going to see a movie for a date? I've heard various opinions uh, which believe it's the worst kind of date to go on because it simply involves looking at a screen for two hours without interacting with each other, as opposed to, say, having dinner where you can talk with each other. What would your response be to these thoughts? And what was your best movie date experience? Hey, thanks a lot. Now, some of you, if you've been following me for a lot of years, you might have heard me talk about this a long time ago. To me, the movie is the best date, especially a best first date. Here's why. Watch it, but, but a movie should never be the only thing you do on your date. Here's why, okay? You go to a movie, and when I was out dating before I met Anne, um, movies would always be the first dates. At least nine times out of 10, they'd be the first dates. And they always were great, because here's what you do. You go to a movie, because especially if it's a first date, you don't know each other really well, you're a little bit uncomfortable, so what do you do? Let's go into a low pressure environment to start. What's more low pressure than a movie theater when you're not being forced to look at each other in the eyes and make small talk or whatever? It's a totally low pressure environment. So you start off your date in a totally low pressure environment. You go into the movie and you watch the movie. Now when you come out of the movie, you've got to make sure you either have dinner or drinks planned for after the movie, not before. Big mistake by rookies is dinner, then a movie. Uh-uh-uh. Movie, then either late dinner or drinks. That is the order, and here's why. You start off the date in a low-pressure environment, like a movie, and now when you've come out of the movie, now what do you got? You've got a shared experience you just had. You guys just together watched a movie together. And now when you go out to drinks or dinner, you instantly have something to talk about right away, an experience that you just shared. You can now instantly start. Now, you don't want to just talk about the movie all night, but what better starting point for conversation than a shared experience that you just had together? For that reason, dates, movie nights are the perfect dates, especially first dates. Once again, because it's a low pressure environment to start, then once you come out, you have a common point of reference and a shared experience to start your conversation with. It is the absolute best thing to do. All right, last question of the day that I'm going to sign off here. This one comes from Daniel Vasquez, who writes, what do you think of DreamWorks Animation's Trolls so far, and how much uh, you think it will do at the box office opening weekend and total domestically worldwide? Thanks off the question. Look, full disclosure, um, my wife is senior project manager at Hasbro, uh, and Trolls are a Hasbro property. And DreamWorks is making the movie. So I just want to give, so nobody accuses me later that I have some secret hidden agenda, my wife, senior project manager at Hasbro. Okay, letting you know that right up front. Um, I think it's too early to tell. Like they just put out like first trailer. Um, they still have a lot of work to do and their, their, their marketing campaign is really just getting going. So I think at this point, it's too early to call. Um, ask me again in two or three weeks once some more marketing comes out and we get a chance to get a feel from people about what they're thinking about the trailers. If I had to take a wild guess right now, 
I'd say 40 million opening weekend, not bad. Uh, but again, don't hold me that number because that number is going to, pardon me, that number is going to radically change in a couple of weeks once they have a chance to really roll out their marketing. And then we'll get a real sense of whether or not people are going to, it's going to appeal to people or not. We just don't have that information yet. So uh, it's hard for me to see. So check back with me on Trolls a little bit later. All right, guys, that'll do it for me for this installment of the John Campy podcast. Thank you so much for joining me again, guys, make sure you're following uh, my new show film HQ on the comic con HQ network, going over to www.comic-conhq.com to subscribe to the channel. It's $4.99 a month or $5 a month filled with amazing, great content, movies, documentaries, and also original programming like from me, Mark Hamill, Nathan Fillion, uh, Alan Tudyk, uh, lots of great people. And our show with me, John Schnepp, Film HQ. Make sure you come on over and watch that. Again, make sure you can email me at the John Campia podcast at gmail.com. And uh, that'll do it for me, guys. Thanks a lot for joining me. My name's John Campia. Make sure you subscribe to this YouTube channel and look right here. That's where you can find me on Twitter and on Facebook, simply at John Campia. Uh, if you are listening to this podcast, make sure you open it up in iTunes and like and comment. Uh, rate and comment on this podcast. That helps me out a great deal. And again, subscribe to this YouTube channel and keep on coming back. So that'll do it for me, guys. Thanks a lot for joining me. My name's John Campion. Until next time, bye-bye.